for taking time out of your day, and thank you all for your patience um, for showing up for uh, what is hopefully a really substantive debate and discussion. Um, my name is Jordan Foley. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Assistant Director of the Debate Team. Um, and I'll be moderating the debate between the uh, two participants we have here. So on my uh, right is Thomas Lear, um, a free speech and gun rights activist who's the founder of the Freeman Report here in Madison. And on my left uh, is C.B. Vatola Haddad, who's the director of debate uh, at UW-Madison and a member of the General Defense Committee and the Industrial Workers of the World, where they participate in mutual aid efforts um, in the Madison community. Um, both participants agreed to the following topic and format and time constraints, so just so we're all kind of on the same page. The topic um, is uh, a debate about uh, the phrase, individual autonomy is the highest moral good, um, a debate about individualism versus collectivism. Um, the format for the debate, we have three questions. I, it may be the case that we have to cut some of them off given the time limitations, but um, we have a couple of questions that will allow for open participation between both of the um, uh, participants. Um, once we ask any of the questions, one um, of the two will speak for six minutes, give kind of an opening statement followed by a six minute response by the other. Um, subsequent interactions between the two will have a limit of about four minutes. Um, and I'll kind of uh, nudge each of you all if you're getting closer going over. Um, sorry, I just have to, it wasn't for some reason built, so I'm just fixing that real quick. And then we'll be off. Um, and we also encourage um, audience participation, but we ask that you hold your questions um, for the end when we have a free uh, set of time for people to ask questions at the very end. Um, if you do want to submit a question or suggest a question um, and you have a Twitter account, you can tweet us at, at @badgerdebate, and I'll try to work that into um, the questions um, if there's sort of a lull between um, each of the things that we're talking about. So um, without further ado, um, I think we should just kind of get into it. So again, individual autonomy is the highest moral good is the uh, sort of topic of debate. Uh, and the first question that uh, we have is, um, there are a lot of different ways that people define and understand what individualism and collectivism are. Um, and so would you um, each sort of explain what you mean by your, uh, each of your positions? So for CB, what is collectivism? Um, and for Thomas, what is individualism? And why do you think um, that it's the best way to organize society? Great. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, I'm sorry that we got started a bit late. Uh, Thomas and I wanted to start out with a definitional question because within scholars of both traditions there is a lot of confusion and debate over what these terms mean. And I personally come from the tradition of socialist anarchism, which is sometimes also known as libertarian socialism. And one of the core tenets of socialist anarchism is a deep skepticism about the idea of centralizing power away from all people, whether that's economic power or governmental power. And needless to say, as an anti-authoritarian philosophy, socialist anarchists have been some of the strongest critics of the USSR, um, modern-day Venezuelan government, and things like that. Um, and so if the first tenet of socialist anarchism is the decentralization of power, then the second tenet is worker empowerment and the broader philosophy of community democracy. And so the socialist part of socialist anarchism is the demand that workers have direct democratic control over their workplaces. And broadly, that communities should have direct democratic control over the resources that we share and use. And there are many different kinds of work that is required to make society function. Uh, just in this room, from the people I know that we have, uh, we have people who work in bookstores, we have factory workers, uh, we have podcasters, students. Uh, and by all doing our part in working together, we collectively build the infrastructure that make our daily lives possible. Socialists believe in acknowledging that humans are, by our natural, nature, social creatures. Uh, a person who can roam the world and go anywhere they are, please, unmolested, uh, is free only in body but not in spirit. There's a reason why we call solitary confinement torture beyond the trauma of keeping a person in a human cage. We may exist as individuals, but we're individuals who live our lives in the flow of sociality. Uh, so we may appreciate returning home at the end of the day to a space that we call our own to... Uh, you know, kind of recuperate at the end of the day. But if we had to spend 30 years alone in our home with nothing but our own private property, uh, we would call that torture. This is not to harbor any pretensions about the innate goodness of, or badness of human nature. People are not perfect, and we can think of plenty of historical examples where people have been downright evil. Um, but by combining a philosophy that decentralizes power into the hands of the many through direct democratic control, with one that acknowledges that humans live our life in a flow, Interacting uh, you know, with people directly to exchange goods and services or over the flow of friendship or sometimes out of a sense of social obligation, uh, such as caring for our elders or the sick. And what emerges is a, is a society, 
that doesn't just passively protect people's freedom, but actually fights for those freedoms to be preserved for every single individual, and not only requests, but incentivizes that people fight for each other's freedoms. If society is constructed, as is present-day America, on the principles of individualism, then the society that emerges will atomize people, destroying cultures and traditions that rely on the strength of a community to keep themselves going. Encouraging people to think only of themselves as the entirety of their political worldview, the only important variable in their political calculation, the labor that they had been doing in service of the community no longer makes sense. Contributions to the cultural institutions that hold democracies together, whether those are libraries or schools or churches, don't produce, that don't produce anything other than uh, you know, producing a place for us to satisfy our need to be together, uh, they lose rel relevance or they become authoritarian to cope with the environment of austerity and defunding that individualist ideology justifies. There's no freedom in the free market. Yes, you have property rights that are protected, are protected in theory, I should say, because police <coughs> regularly disregard people's property rights and eminent domain laws mean that the government can decide uh, if it's necessary to annex your property and enforce that with the full policing power of the state. Uh, but that means that whoever owns the property also owns the right to decide what the rules are, which dispense people's rights at the gate. In the workplace, as current affairs editor Nathan Robinson has argued, it is essentially, democracy is essentially suspended at the door. As soon as you go into work, you are in a dictatorship. When people own large shares of the property, and in particular, when they own large shares of the property that can generate profit, either because of the natural resources or human resources that have been invested into it, uh, they can spend people's lives in a way that seriously undermine their freedom uh, for at least 40 hours a week, but for more people, more like 60 or 80. That's a third to our half of our lives that we live on somebody else's terms. Being forced to live without a say in the conditions that we live in is the definition of tyranny. Libertarian capitalists also often misunderstand this and think that socialists are lazy and don't want to do work. What we actually believe is that people who do the work should have a say in how the workplace runs, and that people who do not have working conditions, uh, and that people shouldn't have working conditions where their <coughs> lives are run by the whims of their bosses, because even a benevolent dictator is still a dictator. If you believe that there should be no taxation with representation, you already philosophically believe that there should be no labor without representation, because taxes are ultimately your labor given uh, economic value. And looking at the status quo and the challenges that we face in the world, the need for direct democratic control now is more urgent than ever. Corporations are monoliths, destroying the environment, causing people to live shorter lifespans, incentivizing the exploitation of people economically, forcing massive migration that destabilize entire continents. Even the golden goat of individualism, small business owners, have their freedom severely restricted by the increasingly centralized economic powerhouses that dominate every industry. With companies like Amazon and Facebook, corporations privatize the market itself, which means that even if a free market was possible, it inevitably privatizes itself and becomes a dictatorship. Employees have been threatened with firing if they don't get tested to see if they are a match for their boss's brothers who need a kidney, for getting sick too many times, for taking too long to use the bathroom. So when we're talking about the suspension of factors for worker freedoms, we mean being forced to work in conditions where your basic health is compromised and your wages are kept so low that the best thing you can hope to is to jump to another job where maybe your boss is a little bit nicer. And how many of us have parents who came home angry day after day, year after year, because of their working conditions? It's toxic on a home and on a community. I need to remind us of the other incredible shortcomings uh, of the government is that it encourages us to, re to think nationally, which has wreaked havoc on our foreign policy. The concentration of decision making and power leads to things like war, uh, particularly things like war in Iraq or Vietnam, which were against the public opinion, uh, but were carried out because they were in economic interests. And so if we have magically had an egalitarian democratic society on the day we went to war with either Iraq or Vietnam, um, you know, after some time we would not have been in those wars anymore um, because they weren't popular. So, yeah, I'm going to start with that for now. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, um, you believe in uh, libertarian socialism, but it's essentially anarchy. Um, do you believe in, like, federalism? Do you believe in state and local governments or state and federal governments? Like, how, how, would it, how is that arranged? Do you, do you have an idea of how you want things to be, like, because, and I, I mean, I guess I can leave this into my, my spiel. So, in our, uh, in our current society, in the current constitutional federalist republic, we have representatives who represent our ideas. Our founders were smart enough to understand that uh, tyranny by the majority is just as bad as tyranny by the individual. Um, direct democracy usually leads to tyranny by the majority. Um, just because the mass agree, or the, the majority of the populace agrees to something doesn't make it just. What is just and what is not just? 
um, is, the, is the bigger question. How do we order our society so that every individual can exercise their rights freely without being infringed and also without having to be oppressed by the majority? Because I feel like um, most of the times when the collective is in charge, the minority suffers. And oppression is usually the uh, is rooted usually in the majority, the collective, doing these things. So when societies are run based on the community rather than uh, the protection of the individual, you have uh, just as much tyranny as you would by a few. A tyranny by the few or a tyranny by the majority. They're both tyranny irregardless. Uh, regardless. Um, so that's, that's, why, that's why I believe in the society that we have now. That's why I believe in the individualist society that we have now. Um, slowly we've been moving away from that and uh, using uh, neoliberalism or, or, demo, or uh, democratic socialism to enact these uh, things that seem like they're good for the little guy but end up actually insulating industries from having to compete when they don't have to compete. They don't actually have to, res they don't actually have to uh, com you know, compete with people entering the system. And so it really keeps the little guy out, keeps the small business out, uh, kills Main Street, um, and really allows them to have free reign over pricing, over things like that. Um, and so uh, our society is ordered in a way where we have a constitution and a bill of rights. The bill of rights protects natural rights. What is a natural right? A natural right is something inherent to you that you don't need any outside force to exercise. Um, I can defend myself with a rock. I can speak on the street. You know, I don't necessarily need a uh, platform, on, you know, a digital platform or a... Uh, or a bullhorn, I can just speak and say what I want without fear of state force or fear of uh, public force or civilian force used against me for what I say because speech is not violence. Um, so we have to understand the difference between a right and privilege. I do not have the right to somebody else's labor when they make what they make. It is their right to, to distribute that as they see fit and get paid for it, what is, what is worth it, you know, what, what is worth it for them. So they've, ex they've had spent time in school, they've spent time getting educated, so how can I, I tell them to turn around and say that is now a right, health care is a right. Um, it is not, it is a commodity. You cannot make rights out of other people's property. And I know that's, uh, that's not a uh, popular idea these days. Would you like somebody to come into your house and tell you, okay, your house is too big, uh, we all need to equally distribute this. So you move into this smaller room of your house and then we're going to put different people into every other room of your house so that we are all equally distributing your property, which is now, this, now essentially communal property. People are government. There's no difference between people and government. The only difference between people and government is a desk. They get jobs in the government or they get jobs in the communal uh, delegation in which they uh, figure out ways to communally distribute things, but that doesn't mean they are making just decisions, that doesn't mean they are making good decisions, it just means they are making decisions communally. And so we see that really there is oppression that comes from the majority. Um, it's not always one person, it's not always the state um, in, a, in a definite way. But the community itself can be a type of state that enacts tyranny on, on another person because really in order to enact any policy, you need force. How will you make people redistribute their things? They're their things. I know that if somebody came to my house and said, your stuff is now the public's stuff, I would fight to the death for it. I would fight to the death for my property. And that's the way it is. So you will have to use force. And what happens when you give, say, a local militia, say it was a local libertarian socialist militia, right? And you gave them the power to exercise force on the behalf of the commune. What's stopping them from enacting tyranny onto the commune or completely destroying the commune and then just becoming a dictatorship? That's what we see with all collectivism. We see the French Revolution ended in blood, ended in terror, ended in tyranny. 
we see uh, fascism, collectivism, ended in, ended in blood, ended in terror, ended in tyranny. We see the USSR, ended in blood, ended in terror, ended in tyranny. And regardless of whether libertarian socialism doesn't believe in the state or doesn't believe or didn't you know, uh, oppose the USSR, it, the fact remains that every time collectivism has become an incarnation in reality, it has become tyranny and has oppressed people and killed people by the bushel. So that is why I believe the protections that we have in this country for the individual are the best way to arrange society, is to cater to the individual <coughs> rights of every human being. Yeah, um, I'm going to start with what Thomas said about a Bill of Rights being extremely important. And I agree completely. A Bill of Rights is a collectivist document that we come together and we decide what are the rights that we think each other owes. We decide what we owe each other as people. The thing about individual responsibility is we don't just have responsibilities to ourselves. We also have responsibilities to each other. Those are not less of individual responsibilities just because they are aimed at the collective. So yes, a collectivist document that ensures the protection of all individuals is incredibly important in making sure a society does not turn into tyranny. But it's also important to note uh, a couple things. First, that even in the status quo, we see how collectivist institutions are better at enforcing the rights in a Bill of Rights than anything an individualist society can produce. Uh, YouTube right now uh, is going through and deleting thousands of people's YouTube accounts because they don't like the content they produce. Facebook shadow bans anyone who is a political dissident uh, or outright bans their account. We saw things like the Proud Boys, an entire group of political activists just dis disappeared from Facebook overnight. Uh, and whether or not I think those are a good thing, it could not happen in a public institution. If Facebook was publicly owned, First Amendment rights would kick in and they would not be able to do that to people because it is something that is dictated by the collective will of the Bill of Rights. But when you give individuals infinite power, when you tell them that what is on their property is their domain, you create the ability to create small feudal societies in which people do not have to respect the Bill of Rights because you can say, well, sorry, you know, Zuckerberg, I don't owe you, or Zuckerberg doesn't owe you the server space to keep your Facebook account active, right? You can say, I don't owe you my labor in making sure your rights are protected on my property. You can't force me to do that. And that's a terrible way for society to function. Uh, now, Lear is worried about the tyranny of the majority. I mean, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that majority democracy is not the only democratic process, and I personally do not think it is the best one. I believe in a socialist anarchist society that works on a consensus-based model, which means the people have to come together and make decisions uh, in a way that people, you know, that incentivizes people in particular ways, right, to ultimately meet the end goals of society. Uh, you know, you mentioned healthcare. I think that's a really good example. I'm not sure. So Spain actually has a constitution, and in their constitution's bill of right is the is government mandated healthcare. It says that the government is required to provide people with both preventative health care um, and caring for them after they get sick. And at no point in Spanish history has the government rounded up a bunch of doctors right, with guns and forced them to perform surgery. That's not how a right to health care works. A right to health care works by creating an ideal that society hopes to live up to. Right? In some ways, it is always idealist, and there are always difficult trade-offs that a society has to make. But the point of collectivism is to decentralize the democratic decision-making power so that we make those decisions together, so that one person isn't making a decision for everyone. And that's kind of the best way to insulate people from the tyranny of the majority, right, is through this consensus-making process that encourages people to work together. Now, you said that uh, the tyranny of the majority keeps out the little guy. We should talk about the status quo a little bit more. You want to talk about keeping out the little guy, you should look at Apple and Amazon. Most book publishers right now are forced to rely on the Amazon marketplace to sell their books. And if, Jeff, and if um, yeah, Jeff Bezos decides he doesn't like your content, then he can just not sell your book. And most bookstores, most brick and mortar bookstores, rely on Amazon to move their products. Amazon literally owns the market in book sales. The same thing is true of Apple. If you're a web developer, you're an app developer, if you can't get on the Apple marketplace, you are toast. The tyranny of the minority is what happens when one person or a small board of trustees or something like that is able to dictate the terms under which people live, right? dictate the terms under which they can sell goods and services. And so as concerning as the tyranny of the majority may be, right, and it's true that in any democracy you have to safeguard it, you have to be willing to stand up to tyranny, but even in those societies it is much harder to convince a bunch of people to give up their rights uh, than it is to have one person decide that it is in their personal interest to take something away from you and to give it to themselves. I, I agree with some of, uh, I agree with some of uh, CB's premises, but what we have in our society are built-in 
uh, avenues. Of, uh, they're almost like reset buttons or uh, something, you could call it something like that, for which uh, minor, the minority, the individual, has ways of dissidence. That's free speech, that's the Bill of Rights. And they can stand up to the government or the state force. They have representatives. The Bill of Rights was voted on by a handful of representatives. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a collective. That rep uh, the people voted in their representatives. The representatives passed the 1780-something uh, Constitution, I believe. Forget exactly the date. Um, but we have these built-in uh, ways of dissidence. And even within our, our own... Uh, our own history, we have uh, the founders saying that it is our right to reinstitute government when it no longer serves the will of the people. And that doesn't mean just the majority or just, or just the minority, it means both. And Amazon is a great example of socialist, uh, statist socialist style subsidies making the marketplace impervious to the little guy. You have these subsidies going to Facebook, going to Amazon, going to Google, that are allowing them to corner the marketplace. They're allowed to buy favors and therefore rig the game. That is not an individual society. That is a status socialist style society. I mean, and we could talk about what libertarian socialism would be, but it still remains standing that every incarnation of socialism regardless of whether libertarian socialists believe it's socialism or not, has resulted in tyranny. And yet, we see the, the United States, for all its flaws, has resulted in massive liberty, massive gains in uh, economic opportunities. Whether, whether the, the poor are poor doesn't matter as long as they're living higher than the standard their, their, uh, their fathers and mothers lived at. You have... You have uh, Inequalities in, 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 uh, in monetary status and in, in, in several different things, but there's no way to get rid of that. And if you do, it's usually through statist force. We have built in ways of dissidence in our society. Not only that, but uh, our health care has led to the most innovation. Our, our type of health care has led to the most life saved. And we have, we have given uh, so many people who had diseases that had no hope hope for a cure. And now I, I, I say that the more we open up the, uh, the healthcare market to free, uh, the free, the more we open up the healthcare market and make it more free market and, and less socialized, less, uh, less closed in, prices need to be more transparent, um, there needs to be more competition. The prices will decrease, the care will increase, and we will take care through private charity all those who cannot do for themselves. And if you don't believe that we will take care of it through private charity, then you don't believe in the goodness of people. This is how individualist society works. We, it has worked better than any other society that we have instituted throughout our history as humankind. So what? Uh, Every time socialism, every time the collective has implemented a society, it has led to tyranny. The only revolution I could think of that was based around balancing the minority interest and the majority interest and, the, the, and valuing the uh, rights and freedoms of the individual is this society. And we can get back to that original idea if we can just get past this idea of the government taking care of our problems whether it be a communal government or whether it be a, a government of representatives. Um, one quick question. What subsidies do, does Amazon get from the government? I don't have, I don't have that with me. Okay. I couldn't <laughs> grab my book. Whether or not you believe in theory that these things are possible, in practice they are not. Whether or not you think that Amazon is somehow the product of socialism, the reality is that Jeff Bezos is in control of a massive amount of wealth that Amazon is creating company towns where their warehouses are located, where they literally not just control uh, where they are, but they control all of the houses. They have private security forces where Bezos gets to uh, literally, what's the word I'm looking for, enforce his will on people through a private security force that is not uh, regulated or responsible to the community in the way that a publicly funded police force is. And for all of the things that I may think about policing, I can still acknowledge that a private police force that is not accountable to anyone, something like Blackwater, is still worse than something like uh, an imperialist force. And so the first thing is that even if you believe 
that some kind of mystery subsidy that Thomas can't name for me is how we got here. The reality is that the most violent parts of Amazon, right, the way that they are most able to enforce their will on others is because one person sits at the top of all that wealth and dictates what happens to it. And frankly, I am not particularly sympathetic to the idea that if we take based some of Bezos' money that he makes as the richest man in the world with over $100 billion, and we use that to pay for school so that the people who work in his factories can, you know, so that their kids can go to school, so that the people who built the roads he drives one of his hundreds of luxury cars on can have health care, I'm frankly not very sympathetic to that claim. I'm okay with that. But the other thing is that, you know, Thomas says we have these ways to stand outside, right? We can be dissidents. We have free speech. But the reality is that some people have a lot more speech than others. If you're someone like Rupert Murdoch and you can afford to buy up a bunch of cable channels and other media markets, then you can afford to have a lot more speech than other people. And so it's not just about what you're theoretically entitled to. It's that wealth buys you access to your freedoms. It buys you the right to be healthy right now. It buys you the right to, know, you know, to be able to get around. Uh, and, and that is all you know, something that an individualist society is not really prepared to deal with. Thomas also says that our healthiest, so mm, there's a couple things here, let me see. Thomas says that all collectivist societies have gone to hell. That's not true. Uh, it's not true in a lot of ways. Some of them have certainly been eradicated by genocide, but most collectivist societies that exist today, whether that's in Spain, whether that's Palestine, whether that's Rehova, are shining examples of what it means to live free in the face of tyranny. Collectivist societies that exist today are the ones that are literally standing up to fascist governments that are able to survive in the face of military occupation. Collectivism is far, far stronger than anything that individualism could produce. And if a Palestinian used uh, what a, Thomas believes in a Lockean version of property rights, which means that the labor you put into uh, unclaimed land is what makes it your own, the original property right comes from putting work into raw natural resources. Uh, if someone in Palestine or Rehovah said, well, I planted a bunch of seeds here, and so now nobody else can access this part of the West Bank, right? that wouldn't really be uh, a better form of occupation than what we have now with the Israeli military. And so the idea that collectivist societies inevitably okay. turn into tyranny uh, ignores, ignores what is actually happening with them. I'll be good with that now. Um, just to address the point of the subsidies, they've gotten, uh, Amazon has gotten 20 economic development uh, subsidy packages since 2012, uh, totaling $2.4 billion. Uh, one of them is the HQ2, HQ2 auction or something like that. But, uh, I mean, it's, that's from goodjobsfirst.org, uh, if you want to check that. But it's 20, uh, 20 economic development subsidies, that's just Amazon. So, uh, I, I think that our, gov our, way of, our way of life in America has allowed for the way of thinking that we have in, uh, in this generation where things should be equally distributed no matter what. What, we, what, we're not, what we're not taking into account, what CV's not taking into account, is that there are many ways for you to acquire skills in a free market society. There are many ways to make yourself marketable to employers, to advance your position in life, um, and it just takes doing. Um, yes, it, it's, it's easier to live in a place where you don't have to make the decisions. The government makes the decisions, or the uh, governing body, or communal government, or whatever you want to call it, makes the decisions for you, uh, and says, you can make, you, you have this much money, you get this brand of everything, you get the government, uh, you get what the government gives you. The truth is, people who work at Amazon can leave Amazon. They can make themselves a marketable, a, mar a market. They can make themselves skills. They can learn things. Individuals aren't stuck in these jobs. Nobody's forcing them into these jobs. There are many, there are many, I grew up in, uh, in Milwaukee. Both of my parents were Democrats. Uh, they both believe Republicans make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Uh, they, they were on welfare, rent assistance. Um, and, and I grew up in a, in a bad situation. I, uh, Used drugs. I did alcohol. I, I was I was very very addicted to um, some heavy chemicals, but one day I turned around and I said, "I'm going to make myself marketable." I I had what what would be considered a spiritual experience in AA. 
uh, and, I, and I found myself wanting to make myself marketable. Once we want to make ourselves marketable, and when, once we get the chips off our shoulders and stop saying, I am owed this, rather than I want to work for this, that's, that's the nature of human beings. I think that's a lot of what libertarian socialism doesn't take into account, is human nature, that we are corruptible. They were a lot of times greedy. And we can even see this in unions. There's a lot of corruption and racketeering in unions. I can look that up on my phone as well. I mean, just the history of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the mafia in unions is enough to say that it is corruptible. It's a corruptible system. The collective usually leads to corruption. It doesn't have the intrinsic built-in protections for the individual that our country has. And yes, I believe that labor should be able to organize, but it also should not protect the guy from getting fired if he's sleeping in the tool crib. That's laziness. What, what, what makes that guy worth the same as the guy that busts his butt, works, you know, works 50, 55 hours a week? Why is it that there's a lottery, you know, and they draw numbers for who gets, who gets laid off when there's layoffs? The guy who's working really hard should get to stay, and the guy who's sleeping in a tool grip shouldn't. This is what, these are the protections that collectivist society leaves for those who succeed. do not. It, it takes away the incentive to succeed. Why work really hard if the guy that's sleeping in the tool crib is gonna, gonna you know, have the same advantage as you when layoffs come around? There's no advantage to it at all. Libertarian socialism does not take into account human, uh, human nature, human frailty. So, there, yes, Amazon, I believe you, has gotten economic subsidies. But I'm curious how those subs subsidies translate into what we have now, which is not a tyranny of the majority, which is not a socialist chaos, right, which is one person exerting tyrannical control as a dictator over the people who work for him and the people who live around the areas in which he has set up his company property. And so even if it is, of course, true that, yes, public subsidies were given to Amazon, that doesn't translate into a mechanism for the kind of control we see now. And in fact, we don't see that in other places where public sector funding is used. So for example, Thomas Leaker previously mentioned, uh, our healthcare sy system is excellent. We save the most lives. I mean, it's not true. We pay more per capita than any other developed nation, and we get less for that money. Last year, people spent $10,000 a year per person on healthcare. Every other country spent half of that and still gets better healthcare than us. But one thing in particular that bothers me about that statement is the idea that we give people hope for a cure because we develop all of these drugs that are so amazing. 75% of the innovative drugs in any given year are developed by the NIH. Most of the innovation we have is public. It's publicly funded, it's carried out publicly because it is not incentivized by profit. And then, because we do not create infrastructure for the production of those products, we turn around and we have to give the licenses to private companies because we cannot produce them, because we have decided, as a nation, we're not interested in actually making sure people have access to these things. We develop them, but then we don't make sure that they're distributable. Uh, and for that, we pay an extremely high healthcare price. Now, Thomas says that it's easier to live in a society where you don't have to do anything. Again, this is a misunderstanding of what it is that socialists believe. It's not that you should just have everything and you shouldn't have to work. It's that if you're putting the work in, you should get the fruits of that labor. And we should work together to make sure that that is the case for everyone. Jeff Bezos makes the average Amazon worker's salary in nine seconds. I want to tell you, I, I want you to tell me what kind of work he does in nine seconds that equals what the average Amazon worker does in a year. Right? What is he, how does nine seconds of Jeff Bezos taking a piss equal a year of a factory <laughs> worker, right? Who has to pee in a bottle on the factory floor because they can't even take bathroom breaks because the way that he runs his company is to exploit people into the ground and then rely on exactly what it is you said. You don't like it? Go somewhere else. Epic does this too in Verona. They take in a constant stream of recent graduates and they work them into the ground and then they say, go somewhere else, we'll get plenty more people. But the reality is that that bosses collude to lower laborers' prices, right? Adam Smith said this. You may have heard of Adam Smith Thomas, right? Like, kind of a staple person in American history, kind of found, you know, founded many of the principles that this government runs on and said, it's a major problem that within any given industry, the people who run it collude with each other. We see this in Silicon Valley, and we see this with housekeeping services, right? We see this across the board in every kind of labor, that if you, that the managers, right, the owners of companies are colluding with each other to keep down their workers' prices. And so in the status quo, you do not have people getting what they are putting work into, and we think, uh, as socialists, that workers should have a say in how a company is run to make sure that that's not what happens. Uh, now, the other thing, I mean, this is a touchy subject, and 
I'm very happy to hear about your recovery. What devastates me is to hear you say, one day I turned around and said, I'm going to make myself marketable. Your recovery, anyone's, we have so many people in Madison, right? We have an opioid epidemic. We have all of these people suffering from addiction and abuse problems. And it shouldn't take them having to make themselves marketable to someone else in order to get help and to get recovery, right? People should be entitled to recovery when they're down. We have all had those bad days. We have all needed to rely on each other. But if you don't have anyone to rely on, what you shouldn't have is an invitation to go fuck yourself, right? What you should have is the ability to go to a mental health professional, to go to addiction recovery treatment, right? You should have those things in a society that is, as you say, the wealthiest in the world, right? And begs the question of what happens with all that wealth when so many people live in poverty in this nation. Uh, the last thing you said, I'll make this quick, is that socialists don't understand human nature and we take away incentives. Yes, humans are motivated by incentives, but it's a question about what you incentivize them with and what you incentivize them to. Incentivizing people to accumulate a massive amount of power and then wield it over others is not what incentivizes a good society. All right, so uh, what you described with Amazon is a result, the, the subsidies result in them having an edge over the small guys. Small businesses can't enter the market, can't grow to the size that would be competitive to Amazon. Amazon therefore has a, uh, a way of keeping down the little guy and not uh, allowing people to enter the marketplace so these people who are working in his in Bezos' shitty jobs can go to somewhere else and say, you know what, the, the market is flooded. I can go anywhere I want. You need to make it a uh, labor market in which people can go anywhere they want. They can take their skills and tell him to go shove it. That's what I'm for. I'm for being able to tell the big guy to go shove it. Or to just be able to live my life without the collective exerting their will over me. The medical field would be more productive if we didn't have all the insulation that we do in this country, and I would be able to list it off if I had time to grab my notebook. But Daniel, no, I, had to get, I had to get you. Uh, so, there we go. I mean, Fake making yourself marketable, I feel like... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dan. I didn't mean to put that off on you. That's, that's kind of shitty. Uh, so, when it comes down to when it got, comes down to living in this country, you have a choice to recover. There's there's plenty of there's plenty of free things you can do to recover. It's not I'm going to make my recovery rely on uh, being marketable. I'm going to be. I'm going to determine myself towards a better life. If you if you have the will, if you have the if you have the uh, drive, you can make yourself better. There's no uh, there's nobody keeping you down. There's nobody oppressing you. There's just you and the world. All I ask is that the collective stay out of the way. I agree with uh, CV on a lot of things. I believe in small government. I believe in a small Republican federalist government, but I believe in a small government. I believe in Republican democracy because I believe that direct democracy leads to, leads to more tyranny. But we're getting more into the economic side of this, and this isn't uh, capitalism versus communism or capitalism versus libertarian socialism. CV does what she does best, which is take things off topic. When it comes down to the incarnations of collectivism, they don't protect the individual. People end up killed in massive amounts, and people and people's liberties wane every time socialism or a socialist style government or any. This is what I mean. So you can say libertarian socialism is this. This is anarchy. This is what's going to happen. You know, if if you guys just do what we say, okay. So they're saying, if we, if we get together and institute a libertarian socialism, this is what's going to happen. But it always ends up the other way. What happens is there's a revolution, the people that helped start it, they get killed off, the dictator rises to power, and then everybody suffers. You can see that with uh, Mao, you can see that with Lenin, you can see that with Hitler, you can see that with Mussolini and Giovanni Gentili, who takes... Giovanni Gentili, when he talks about fascism, talks exactly out of Rousseau's book, or exactly out of the collectivist book. It's exactly out of the collectivist book. It says, the people's expression of will, but the people are now the state. 
and the state's head that its real expression of will is the dictator. And so that's what collectivism is. It doesn't matter what it could be, it doesn't matter what it should be, it matters what has taken place on this earth. And, it, and we could talk about economic policy all day, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the individual's autonomy is the greatest form or highest form of moral authority. We must protect the individual at all costs. That is what this is about. It isn't about, we can, we can, we can debate the finite points of economics all day, but we've gone to the point, we're, we're going to the point where this debate is more uh, economic policy, capitalism, free market versus socialism, communism, co-ops, collectives, unions, all that stuff. That's not what I came here to debate. I came here to debate collectivism versus individualism. And the facts are that, in, that collectivism has led to the most deaths in human history. Actually, uh, with FDR on the mind, FDR was referred to as the Dolce of America. And he liked that. He liked that they did refer to him like they did Mussolini. Because Mussolini said he had the will, he had the idea to tell the people what's what. He knew how to drive his government. That is fascism. That is collectivism. Sure. Question. In any of the governments you mentioned, can you name one policy any of those governments passed that moved power from the hands of a capitalist into the hands of the workers? Can you name any policy that decentralized decision-making authority to the workers of a workplace or to a community? No, they actually uh, used a form of corporatism in which they had the uh, businesses do the will of the state, kind of like China with Xi Jinping. Right. The, so, the, they, they, yeah, but they adhere to the will of the state. The will of the state, the state is the people, the people are headed up by the dictator. So, so can you describe any of those governments that had a decision-making authority that the state used that was premised on the idea of decentralized collective control? No, because okay. that's not what that's happens good. when libertarian we're, we're socialism into my is speech instituted. And I actually feel very comfortable with that. Look, the first thing you said is if you don't like it working at Amazon, go somewhere else. Amazon and Walmart are some of the biggest employers in this country. So the idea that you can just go somewhere else forgets the fact that millions of people work for them. And frankly, going somewhere else doesn't really help because that means someone else takes that job. And just because I get mine because I get to move out of this terrible job and go somewhere slightly less exploitative, that doesn't really help me if it means that someone else has to take my place, which is exactly what happens. And I think it's ridiculous to see a worker, a multi-multi-billionaire, someone who has more wealth than most of the countries on this planet, to look at them, to look at the way they exploit their workers and to say, eh, just go somewhere else if you don't like it, and not, what the fuck, you cannot do that to people, right? That's the response that we should have to someone who is exploiting their workers, not go somewhere else, but you can't treat people like that. It is not your individual right to not give your workers health care. It is not your individual right to take so much of the work that people do every single day for you that you make their salary in nine seconds, right? You, people are not getting paid for the work they are doing. It is all going into the profit that Amazon makes and what Jeff Bezos personally makes. And even if you could, so many of the industries in this country are now concentrated to the point where it wouldn't really matter if you left one job and went to another, you would still functionally be working for the same person. You have four snack foods that produce more than one half of all foods. You have eight coffee and tea companies that produce 70% of all coffee and tea. You have four of the biggest po book publishers taking in 40% of the revenue. Right? You have eight software publishers who own almost half the market. The idea of telling people to go somewhere else doesn't make sense when we know, when we have documentation, that the four or five companies that own an industry are meeting with each other and colluding to keep down their workers' wages. The idea of going somewhere else doesn't respond to the actual reality of the problems that we face as a nation right now. And telling everyone you know what, we've gotten to a point where now there's so much consolidation, there's so much power in the hands of certain individuals, why don't you just abandon it, is not a very good answer. And deregulating those corporations, right, giving those individuals even more power, is not an answer to the problems that people face. Now Thomas says that collectivism just devolves into do what we say or else. Uh, he can't actually name any historical examples in which collectivism has done that, and he's also, again, ignoring the fact that collectivist societies that exist now are fighting tyranny across the world. They are helping each other survive in some of the worst conditions imaginable, and that is what we are up against, right? Whether it is, economic, whether it is environmental destruction, whether it is inequality, we are up against a situation uh, in which most people, well, we're up against situations that require a collective strength because these are collective problems. And saying everyone just out for themselves, right, that's not going to actually solve these. 
Now, Thomas is wondering why I spend so much time on the economics of this, right? I thought we were here to talk about individual rights. But if you believe in Lockean property rights, if you believe in Lockean individualism, then what you believe is that individual autonomy is fundamentally centered on property rights, which is an economic concept. Locke's very idea of, uh, of property rights, again, to go back to it, is putting labor into the land. It is about labor, right, that, that allows people to have their rights in the first place. Which makes sense because money doesn't just give you the ability to construct your own feudal empire, which it absolutely does, uh, but it also purchases more freedoms for you. As economist Rob Larson wrote, with a large fortune, you can afford more accountants to free you from your tax burdens, more doctors to free you from preventable disease, and more attorneys to free you from the consequences of disobeying civil laws, which is what these bosses do. They turn around, they don't pay their taxes, uh, and any time their workers try to sue them, they force them through an involuntary... Um, arbitration agreement, which means that they're not able to access collectivist modes of disagreement. Instead, they have to sit in front of a meteor, mediator, who, by the way, is paid by the company. And if they don't side with the company, they will be fired. Uh, so you have massive conflicts of interest all over the place. Uh, but you, know, you, you end up in a situation where individuals are able to purchase freedom, not just for themselves, but at the expense of other people. Right? Jeff Bezos' ability to work his workers into the ground is his freedom at the expense of all of those people who work for him. Uh, and so when you say things like, you know, the solution is to give everyone an equal chance to become wealthy uh, and just hope that you're one of the people who doesn't get screwed over in that process, uh, the grain of truth there is that the idea of freedom is expensive, it is demanding on people's labor, uh, and it works best when we distribute it and we fight for each other's freedoms and we refuse to cede uh, in the face of tyranny. Okay. So I agree with you on a lot of that. Deregulate society. Regulations are what causes the consolidation of power. Uh, to name the EPA, I think that's a great. I think that's a great organization to protect the environment, right? So the EPA actually protects uh, protects businesses when they pollute. They don't actually. Uh, you're not able to actually sue them directly. The EPA actually causes uh, gives them a fine, which is necessarily graft. Here, I'll pollute. Here's the money. Blah blah blah. There we go. But you cannot, individuals cannot sue them. If the individual litigation was allowed, then they would be sued into the ground. These are things that, are, that happen in a society that is collecting power to the state. And that's what's happened with real collectivist societies. They collect power to the state. I mean, again, you say you can't name one, uh, one policy that uh, de decentralized power in, in, these, uh, in these collectivist societies doesn't negate the fact that they're collectivist societies that are based on Rousseau and principles. That's, that, that's not what I'm debating. I agree with you in all these things. We should deregulate things. And if we deregulate things, then we can open up the market for the small guy to be able to compete with the big guy. And the big guy's not going to be able to, uh, to stay the big guy for long. There's always a co competition. Competition is good for the market. It allows for the improvement of technology. To pro uh, it provides for the uh, innovation and in technology that we need in society. You, I want a chance to be able to be happy through my own works. And you said it yourself. You said, freedom is expensive, that we must be able to equally share freedom. So I'm assuming that by that you mean that some people need their freedom limited so that others can have more freedom. What do you, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean that, that what do you mean so we, we equitably uh, disperse freedom? Does that mean that what freedoms will be chastised from some and what, what freedoms will be given to others? For, so, like I said, a collectively agreed upon bill of rights would stake out what people's freedoms are, but yes, absolutely, freedoms have limits. So, for example, uh, if you are free to, you know, you're not free to beat the shit out of me, right? Like, you're not, because then I have a freedom to be free from violence, right, to be free from your coercion, and so your right to move your body however you please throughout the world is limited at the moment it comes into contact right with mine. No, and that, that I would agree that that's individualism, that's saying... Okay, we're each individual bodies, and we have the right to be free from uh, outside forces enacting, uh, you know, acting upon us. So, I'm free from violence from somebody else, and and I'm and there's multiple layers to that. We've enacted a federalist style Republican government to uh, help us put in laws to stop the infringement, which I disagree with any law that would not would would be victimless. There's no vic there's no crime if there's no victim. So I agree with. Any, anything that infringes your, your rights, that's a crime. So we have those protections. And I also have the protection of the Second Amendment, which allows me, 
if you infringe on my property, if you infringe on my life, if you infringe on my rights, I will shoot you. And that's just the way, that's the, that's the way it is. These, these, are, these are protections for the individual and, and has allowed historically, through history, the, the most amount of freedom that the, the regular people, the, the, the plebeians, have ever had. In the history of the world, we have the most freedom, we have the most wealth, we have the most excess of wealth, we have, we, we have uh, you know, a weight problem in this country that is completely outrageous, and that's not just amongst rich people, that's amongst everybody. We live in a fat country. We live in an excessive country. We live in a country that's excessive because of the success of individualism and the Republican democracy. If we live in the wealthiest country in the world, I would love to know why 44 million people in this country live in poverty. I want to know why people die of preventable diseases every day. I want to know why people are cutting their medications in half because they can't afford them because they don't have health insurance. I want to know why people have to sell their homes to pay for their children's insulin. And yeah, you're right. They had a free choice. They could have said, sorry, kid, you're dying. It is what it is. We're not selling the house. This is my property and my freedom. Right? That could be the response we give people. But I don't think it's a very free one. I kind of envy the libertarian ideal of freedom, and I understand why people feel drawn to it, because it feels so simple. Freedom is when no one convinced, commits physical violence against you or steals your property, <coughs> and the purpose of government is to punish those who commit crimes and enforce contracts to protect property <coughs> rights. And that sounds really nice. Freedom is when the government doesn't bother me. The problem with this definition is that you can lose all of your freedoms without ever violating those rules. The majority of American adults have less than $1,000 in saving, and many of those are families. If you're poor in Wisconsin as the winter approaches and you are laid off when your job becomes outsourced, you may find yourself with no other options than to sign a 10-year contract of indentured servitude under the threat of starvation. Uh, and, and starvation, homelessness, freezing to death, many things here in Wisconsin that we didn't have to deal with in Florida. Uh, and if you're those homeless people in Madison, right, most of those people work full-time full full -time or part-time jobs, but the cost of housing here is so expensive uh, that they can't afford houses, and so they struggle to find better employment because they don't have an address, uh, which means that they, you know, can't do things like apply for a job that requires you to have one, right? Can't often enroll their children in school, and so now they have to also teach their children full-time or watch their children full-time. Uh, and technically, yes, uh, signing up for indentured servitude, again, voluntary choice. Uh, and if you say the government has no right to interfere with that, that under the threat of starvation it is legitimate for you to sign a 10-year contract of indentured servitude, uh, then that is not what freedom looks like, right? I do not think that is a meaningfully free choice. That is coercion by any other name. That is tyranny by any other name. Uh, and, and so I think that... Oof, there's just so much there, Thomas. Um, what do you mean by... Well, and, well I, could I ask... I'm sorry. Could, could I ask a question? What uh, what do they mean by poverty? Like, is there is there a number? Is there is there a uh, yearly income? What what do you what do you mean by poverty? Yes, there's a federal poverty guideline. Uh, I think for poverty, it's somewhere around twelve thousand. I want to say. Well, it actually might be fifteen thousand now. It's been a couple years. And then for extreme poverty, it's like is it still twelve thousand? Twelve thousand dollars a year. Look, when you say things like competition is good, competition makes us freer, competition helps us innovate, the reality is that is not what we are looking at. We are not looking at a situation where we have flourishing competition. You go to the store and you look at all of the available beers in Wisconsin. You seem like you have a lot of choices. It looks like there's rich competition. Almost all of those are owned by three companies. You think you have competition, but you don't. And if you're a new company, right, if you're a new beer brewer and you want to get your product out there, you don't just have to compete with those three companies. You have to compete with the manufactured competition that each of those companies creates in order to make it look like there's a flourishing market. So now you're competing with one of a hundred other breweries, even though there's actually only three of them. And so the idea that we can effectively innovate in a situation like this uh, is totally divorced from reality. And it's not enough to just be free from government. Freedom means that you need to also have the capacity to act, and you need to be able to have a say in power when it governs your daily life. Uh, you need to be able to use your freedom in a meaningful way. And you can see why this is so important if you look at something like the sharecropping system. Slavery was a horrific restriction on people's liberty, and it was enforced by the government. Uh, and, you know, it was a, they, they were physically deprived of their freedom. The threat of physical violence was constantly present for anyone who tried to leave. Uh, but after slavery ended, many African Americans entered into the same system through sharecropping where they signed these long contracts, had to work on their, on their master's land. Oftentimes it was the same masters who enslaved them. They went back to work on those same places because the threat of starvation or death was so high. 
that it meant that they were functionally doing the same thing. But at this point, it does not violate any of the tenets of libertarian freedom. Right? Sharecropping is not a violation of libertarian freedom, even though it is fundamentally no different from slavery itself. The only difference is that in one, it is governed by the government, and in the other, it is governed by a boss. Uh, but in both of those situations, the people living in it have no meaningful freedom to speak of. Uh, I don't get it. There's a lot there. Um, and I would say that there, there, has, there has been time. You're, you're saying that there's the three brewers example. Because the bigger, the bigger guy buys up the smaller breweries and consolidates power. And they're able to continue to, to keep their profits at a higher and higher rate without having to pay more, without having to compete more for, for labor because of regulation. Regulation has caused the consolidation of power. Indent indentured servitude is horrible. I wouldn't agree with it. I, dis I disagree with that. But who, you talked, about this, you talked about slavery as well. Who instituted slavery? Who, ag who agreed to slavery? The majority said that it was okay. So that, no, they, the, the majority did. The minority is what fought against slavery. The minority is what, the minority of Southerners ag agreed to it by not doing anything. They agreed to it by not stopping it. And only through a minority movement of abolitionists was it ever changed. The, mi the minority usually has, uh, usually causes any type of real meaningful change. It starts as a minority and, and grows bigger and bigger. Civil. Only through protecting the individual and protecting their freedoms economically, individually, is any change ever achieved. I would even go as far as to say collectivism is the, only, is, is the, the bare root of oppression. Because only through the majority are people oppressed. Whether it's by uh, just agreeing by just not doing anything or just saying, we can't do anything, we're too small to do anything, I'm not going to do anything because I'm scared to be singled out or I'm scared to be bullied or I'm scared to whatever. Through silence, the majority imposes oppression. That is how it starts. That is how, it, that how, it, this, that is how it's continued. And until the minority starts a movement it, that becomes the majority, uh, that's only when change is actually enacted. I understand the, the plight of the worker, but they, you can go to other jobs. You can make yourself marketable. There are many examples of this. Uh, I, I think the first uh, black Congress member was in Florida. Was he a senator or was he a, uh, an alderman? I think it was a senator. First black senator was in Florida in the 1800s. You can do anything. If you put your mind to it, you can do anything, even against the greatest odds. So I, I hate to hear this like, poor me, like the odds are against me. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. Life isn't easy. Life is hard. But I'd rather live life, a hard life, in an individual society that, it, that has this style of government than a libertarian socialist style of government where... It's going to end up, like, we, like I said, the all, all the real incarnations of collectivism and socialism have been oppressive, have been the most oppressive in the history of the world. That, I, would, I would rather live free and impoverished than live under the tyranny of what socialism has always become. I'd rather be the, the dirt poorest person in the world under a free individualist society than under the tyranny which socialism has always exhibited. Can you name one? No. Dude. I am sorry, I'm sitting here for an hour and a half. I can't too much. Shut up. Yeah, and then should we move on to that? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I'll, I'll respond quickly and then give Thomas also a chance to kind of quickly respond and so we can move on uh, to the next question. Thomas says that all examples of collectivism descend into tyranny but cannot reckon with the reality of places like Rehoboth and Palestine, cannot reckon with maroon cities that existed in the United States where people fought off tyranny together. Says things, and, and even for the societies he mentions that are allegedly collectivist dictatorships, cannot name a single policy that actually instituted a distributed democracy that still resulted in totalitarianism, can only point to places that have become totalitarian because they centralized power in the hands of one person who then used the military to take that over, as opposed to the distributed community self-defense uh, you know, forces that collectivists generally uh, support. The second thing is that 
Thomas makes a couple contradictory arguments here. First says that one of the reasons why slavery was allowed to happen is because people were afraid of being singled out. And that is exactly what is happening right now. Amazon workers are afraid to organize because they will be immediately fired. Captel workers here are afraid to organize because they are afraid of being immediately singled out and fired from their jobs. There are instances in which people have tried to create a union and the company has responded by shutting the entire thing down and offshoring the company. So the idea that people are just free to enter into these voluntary contracts and they can express their freedoms and do whatever they want is not true. And it's becoming less and less true every day. As Amazon and Walmart create company towns, their reach expands beyond just their workers. When they own the schools that are in your communities, when they own the libraries, when they own the doctor's offices, when they own the storefronts, it is impossible to tell people to go work for something else, someone else unless you mean uproot your life move away from your family and go somewhere else. And that's not a fair thing to tell people, right? The idea to tell people that you should just move from the place you were born and raised where your family is, where your friends are, because if you don't like Jeff Bezos' way, that's your only option, is not a just society. It's not a free society, and it is not a place that I'm interested in living in. The other thing that Thomas says is that, you know, he understands that, look, I gotta touch the slavery argument. The majority of people did not, institute slavery. That is just not true. Not only not the majority of people generally, but not even the majority of people in the South. The idea that that's how slavery came about is incorrect. Slavery came about the same way that the founding document of this country came about, which is that wealthy landowners created a system in which their property rights came before other people's right to live free of coercion. That's how slavery became instituted. And, And the idea, right, that, well, everyone complicitly agreed with it, because they didn't stop it. So what, now the situation is that if you want your freedoms, other people need to step in and stop it? Because that is my argument, right? That we cannot stand by quietly while people's freedom are taken from them. Right, you can't sit by silently. You can't say, not my problem, you can't force me to do anything. That protecting freedom for all of us is protecting freedom for every single one of us as individuals. That the best way to actually make sure that individuals are free is by collectivizing the means of power, by collectivizing economic control, by collectivizing our resources and not giving one rich asshole control over an entire town just because they can afford it. That is not freedom. And so you're right, Thomas, that it does take all of us saying, we are going to step in and stop this, ideally not through, right, like not through military might, but through a system of democratic checks and balances, a radical democracy that is capable of enforcing regulations. Now, the last thing, speaking of regulations, is you say regulation is what leads to consolidation. I'm going to touch on this more in the next question, so I won't get too deep here, but that has never happened for any industry. And I challenge you to name one industry in which regulation caused consolidation. Deregulating industries is what stops, or is what allows them to monopolize, is what allows companies and individuals to buy up massive amounts of the market and create mega companies that control industries, right? And regulation is the thing that stops that. Now, not not all regulations are good, right? It depends on what the regulation is. A regulation that says you can, you know, only hire people under the age of 12 would not be a very good regulation for a company to have. But the fact is that monopolies exist when things are so deregulated that people are able and, in fact, incentivized in order to generate more profit, corner a market, and monopolize it. I think you're making me defend a premise that I'm not saying that you cannot get together and make a union or uh, make voluntary contracts with each other. And I don't want to be caught in defending a, that premise, okay? So I'm not saying that you cannot voluntarily get together and change things. But that's why our individualist society works so well is because we have these built-in ways of dissent. We, we have built-in ways to dissent, not just against the government, but against, against jobs. We can create businesses. We can do all sorts of things. And you say, oh, well, you can't just uproot yourself. You can't just quit a job. Yes, you can just quit a job. Yes, you can just uproot yourself. And if you, if you dislike something that much, you're going to. That's, you're acting like as if Jeff Bezos gets to wrangle all these people in and, and jail them. Does he jail them? Is that what he does? Does he say, you cannot leave, you cannot do anything, and fear, the fact that, that people fear to unionize doesn't mean that they're not free to unionize. Yes, they might be targeted. Yes, they might have to make a sacrifice, but that is what individualist society is about. It's not about safety. It's not about being secure all the time. It's about freedom. It's about being free as an individual. Sometimes we have to make hard choices, sometimes we have to do hard things. That's what an individualist society is about. That's, what, that's the freedom I want. If you want a society where every, everybody, nobody has to worry about economic issues, nobody has to worry about housing, nobody has to worry about anything. 
I really feel like that system will lead to tyranny, regardless of if it's by the, the community or whether it's by the dictator. Our nature is to be corrupted. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is how we, that's our nature as human beings. So I'm, I'm not saying these things are easy. I'm not saying they're, they're, uh, they're going to think they are possible. An individualist, individualist society makes them possible. I feel like all these collectivist societies that I named that you say are contradictions and all this other stuff are actually, uh, actually institute laws that prohibit the dissent. The accessibility to uh, ways of dissent is the reason why our system works so well for uh, so many. And you can say it doesn't work well for so many, you can say there are people impoverished, but the thing is, their median income is still greater than their, than their, uh, their forebears. So we're still moving forward, you're just saying it's not far enough. They sh everybody should be equal, everybody should have equal pay, everybody, everybody should have the, the equal amount of living standard. You're saying the living standard should be the same. So we had a lot of back and forth over, I think, a ton of different issues. I want to recenter them. We've talked about several of what we were going to ask in the next few questions, which deal with uh, tech companies like Facebook and Amazon and also um, healthcare. I do want to refocus the conversation on, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of historical examples. I think a couple of things that both uh, are agreeing with is that there are people who are subject to the rule of a very small number of companies and that those create exigent circumstances for people to deal with. How do we do that? Um, and how do we deal with this um, fact that across not just industries but also platforms uh, like social media and broadcasting companies, um, that uh, these present kind of unique challenges for the free flow of information um, and government intervention. I'm curious if we can recenter the discussion on how the individualist or collectivist principles might approach the process of um, uh, media consolidation or consolidation of companies. Is the position that I hear from Thomas that uh, individuals should sort of be able to get together and sort of engage in collective forms of dissidence in some yeah. way. What does that look like? How does that work? And for um, CV, given that there are these Jeff Bezoses that control these things, how would one institute some kind of workplace democracy? I don't know who wants to take that first. Do you want to go first? Okay. okay. Um, so I would say that in an individual society, you can get together, you can put pressure through your dollars. You cannot buy product if you say so. If if Amazon is treating its workers poorly, we shouldn't buy from Amazon, even though it's the biggest, cheapest place on the block. And I think you would, I think CB would say that, uh, and this I might be wrong on this, that uh, some people can't buy other places because they can offer the cheapest price. Well, sometimes again, individual society is about sacrifice for the greater good. We care about each other, and through charity, through through self-sacrifice, we help each other. Get up, uh, get a leg up in life, and that's what's great about the dissent ability in an individualist society. I don't agree with the collection of wealth by uh, and the, the ability to lobby uh, for political influence, but we all have that right to lobby, and I think uh, I think more of us need to uh, to really realize that we can lobby our politicians, we can put pressure on business. We can uh, use litigation or, or combine, combine our money to, uh, to force an outcome that is uh, better suited to a more egalitarian way of living. So, we, like I said, you can have uh, boycotts of goods. You can have um, speech, just your freedom of speech to tell everybody that Bezos is doing this. We have this platform, which is debate. And I, in a lot of states that are collectivist, even, like I said, even if libertarian socialism opposed the USSR or, or, or fascism or all these other things, they are based upon the ideas of the collectivists, and that is the form that they are taking today in uh, the, uh, the knee-jerk reactions of, of hate speech or, or uh, equating speech to violence. Um, that kind of thing is something that is very, very uh, suited to the, the leftist collectivist ideology and ends up being instituted in a way that prevents dissidents in, in any situation in their societies. So I believe that we can, in an individualist society, get together, 
and use those avenues of dissidence that are uh, built into our society uh, to uh, to affect change in the way we'd like. And I guess to, to narrow, I think, the scope of some of this conversation, what happens when those companies control that flow of information, control the ability to engage in those things, things like uh, regulations that happen on places like YouTube or Facebook or the other social media companies that control the flow of information itself. Yeah, I've mined uh, several, different, several different companies form. Other companies, you can create your own company, you can um, create your own platform, create, create your own website. So in terms of how democratizing something like Amazon would work, it, you know, Amazon and Walmart, for all of the things that are wrong with the way that they are run, are sort of incredible feats of engineering and planning. Uh, Walmart in particular, right, is incredibly effective at distributing resources. In fact, they're so effective at distributing resources because they have a concentric model where they have enough capital to be able to buy a, a piece of land to make a warehouse and then create concentric rings around it. And it's so effective that no one can really compete with them and nobody knows what they're doing until they've gotten so far down the road in creating the concentric model that it's impossible uh, to kind of create anything new. But the good news is that these are very, very effective uh, companies and they're effective distribution models. And so democratizing something like Amazon means, you know, and, and there are different ways that democracy looks. It could be things like electing representatives. Uh, it wouldn't look like a union because a union is, of course, just a, a sort of reactionary response to capitalism and not actual democratic decision-making power in the workplace, uh, which is why unions are so quickly corruptible because ultimately you still have management who's able to make selective concessions to the people who lead the unions and that that can become a form of corruption. And so it means things like Having direct control over major company decisions, uh, managers being electable and recallable is often part of it, right? And, and different industries will need to experiment with different ways that this should work. There's not one way to do it. Uh, and so the point of socialist anarchism isn't to say, you must run your company this way. It's to say, companies should be democratically organized uh, and that they cannot exploit people in these ways, right? That there should be a bill of rights around labor, not just around individuals. That it should include uh, all of the different ways in which we live our lives. Now, I mean... I gotta say, I find myself very much agreeing with Thomas, right? The idea that society only can function when we make individual sacrifices for the greater good is probably the motto of collectivism. Right, if you want a democratic society, you need an institution that builds and manages the ballot boxes. That's something you do not want a company doing. You do not want a corporation to manage your election. Right? That, there's a pretty obvious reasons why there would be a conflict of interest. And so when Thomas says something like, you know, well, I don't agree that you should be able to buy corporate influence or you should be able to buy political influence, uh, but the reality is we can all choose to buy political influence. Well, some people can choose to buy a lot more political influence than others. And you look at private corporations, right? Things like uh, Facebook is a very, very good example uh, of how you know things like public relations campaigns, things like media consolidation, produce an environment in which it is impossible to be a well-informed consumer, and which it is impossible to be well-informed generally, in which any kind of dissident political thought is systematically censored without any government intervention whatsoever. Things like Facebook selling data to Cambridge Analytica, which is a British consulting firm that used the personal data to influence voters in the 2016 elections. Things like Facebook going through and manipulating their users. They ran experiments on 700,000 people, and they didn't tell a single one of them. They manipulated people's emotions without their consent. Well, I'm sorry, you signed an end-user license agreement that I'm sure you didn't read because nobody reads 70 pages worth of legal documentation to use Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> but they ran experiments where they manipulated people's timelines because they ultimately have total control over the algorithm, just like YouTube. They can show you whatever it is they want you to see, and you don't even know it's happening to you. So they gave some people really depressing stories and made a bunch of people very sad and anxious. And then they showed other people really happy things, like puppies, because they wanted to see what would cause people to become more addicted to their platform, because they wanted to use it to hook you. People often say things like, we're not the users of Facebook, we're the product. I think it's much more nefarious than that. Shoshana Zuboff has a book called Surveillance Capitalism, where she talks about how it's not that we're Facebook's products. We are the endless supply of raw behavioral data that Facebook extracts out of us, oftentimes without our knowledge, oftentimes through manipulation, that it analyzes and repackages and gives to other companies so that they can coordinate across applications so that when your running application notices that you've gone on a run, they know that you're high off the endorphins. And then they tell other companies like Amazon to sell you running shoes at that moment. 
Right? The way that we are being manipulated is far beyond what any individual could be expected to grapple with. And so that's why Thomas is right. Sometimes we have to make individual sacrifices for the greater good. Sometimes Bezos cannot have the 200th Tesla that he owns. Right? Sometimes that money has to go to people who don't have teeth. Right, to people who need health care, people who need a place to live. Because you want to talk about utilitarianism, there is diminishing returns for the people uh, who make that, right? There are diminishing returns for people who have extreme amounts of wealth compared to what people who can take, you take $1,000 from Jeff Bezos versus taking $1,000 from anyone in this room, those are two very different propositions. So you want to think about the utility of money, then distributing something uh, and through, and, and not distributing money necessarily, but distributing power in a way that makes it possible to redistribute resources uh, is the only way that we can get out of the current situation that we're in. I, I agree with CB on like 90% of that. How would you, uh, how would you redistribute resources in a uh, libertarian socialist society? Like what if there were people that didn't want their stuff redistributed? I mean, in my opinion, this is something that has to be established from the jump, right? The problem with America, the reason why we are experiencing the highest levels of economic inequality in history, right? The reason why power is so evenly distributed and there are so many consolidated industries is because we started out with a myth. We started out with a lie that all men were created equal when reality was only white landowning men, right? And that the policies in our country for hundreds of years were dictated by a very small demographic of people and it's very hard to undo that. And so what does it look like? Well, it looks like taking what we have now, providing some form of transitional care while we work out what exactly we need to do with the way that things are. It looks like most private property probably becoming public, which is how things used to be before people stole property from other people. Right? When we got here, this was not unoccupied land. This was Ho-Chunk land, right? This was many people's land, and they were using it collectively before we privatized it and stole it from people. Right? Public parks are a very good example of how people are actually quite good at taking care of land together. Right? There's no, nobody checks you in at the public park and says, you know, okay, well, you're in the socialist communist society, so now you only have 10 minutes in the public park. Right? We mostly trust people to regulate themselves. What we do is we create norms around use. Right? You can't steal the grill that's bolted to the public park uh, because that's a communal resource. So we create norms around how we're allowed to engage with resources, right? how we should share them, uh, and then we enforce those only when exploitation becomes an issue. Uh, I don't think that answered my question, but uh, how would the people that don't want to give up their property be, be made to give up their property? I mean, through some form of democratic decision making, ideally, but you're right. If at some point Jeff Bezos does not want to give up the entire town he owns for all of the people who live there, then yeah, Jeff Bezos, I don't know, probably gets the guillotine. Is that what you want me to say? Force. That's government. Government is force. But government that is exactly what individualist societies are, Thomas, right? How does Jeff Bezos get me off my property? You said you would shoot me. You said if I wouldn't leave your property for the crime of existing in your driveway, you would shoot me. So don't tell me that what I propose is violent when Jeff Bezos' workers are literally living and dying according to his will, right, where their entire lives are dictated by him, where he has a private police force that can detain people that is not subject to any public oversight, that is not subject to any any public accountability, when Blackwater goes into countries and kills civilians and faces very little accountability for that, where the owner of the company, Eric Prince, most certainly faces no accountability despite directing people to go out and murder civilians. And so the idea that it would be too violent if someone who controls the lives of a hundred million people to control that person for a second, right? I don't think it comes to murder. I really don't, because I think that most people don't want to die. But if the question is, is it so violent to take away Jeff Bezos' property by force, when you're telling me that he can shoot me for being on it, then no, I, will, I don't think that's a particularly violent solution. I think there's avenues for dissidents, and you can use litigation, and we're using litigation. In fact, we, uh, you can lobby the government, say, let's, let's make uh, Facebook declare, are they a publisher, or are they a public, uh, a public square? Because if they're a public square, then they're governed by March versus Alabama, which states that a public square owned privately is still subject to the First Amendment. These are avenues of dissidence. You're saying you're going to use force. We can use litigation within our individualist society to break these things up. And as we speak, they are being broken up. They are being worked against. People like, people like Daniel Durst, people like myself, are doing what we do, which is rally the people individually to come together in, our, in a collective uh, voluntary agreement to stop these things from happening, to break up these uh, social media monopolies, to speak truth to power. 
But in a, she's, in a libertarian socialist society, you will eventually come to the point where there is a force needed that is killing people or maiming people. Um, and I disagree with Jeff Bezos' private police force, and I think that would be unconstitutional if you took it to, to court. Um, but I think that the communal government, once developed, once their, once their force is developed, where they can remove property forcefully through death or maiming or whatever, it will continue to grow. There are no, there, there are no systems that I've seen laid out in libertarian socialism the individual rights, yeah, but I don't see it going any way but the same way it's always gone, which has been uh, blood, terror, and death. There is something deeply wrong with a society where someone can work a million people into the ground, but enacting any kind of force on that one person is violence, right? There's something deeply wrong with a society that operates like that. There's something deeply wrong with the failure to recognize that the military has been, right, that the military and police forces are how private property rights get enforced. You can, and every single solution that you have come up with that is not the use of direct force, that is not shooting someone on your property, is a collectivist arrangement. Right, you cite Marsh versus Alabama. The idea that if a private company owns too much of the public square, the public actually gets to coerce those people into doing things differently. That is a public solution to a problem that would not even exist in a collective world, right? That is only created by individualism. The idea that we should just keep allowing corporations to create monopolies and then the collective should come in and forcibly break them up. How do you break up a corporation, Thomas, right? How do you go about that? You have a lot, yeah, you do litigation, but litigation doesn't break up a company. Litigation doesn't make the workers work differently. Litigation doesn't get rid of the private security security force that forces workers to, you know, leave and come in or whatever it is, right? There is, that is only possible. And it is frankly wild to see an individualist act like the entirety of individualist property rights aren't predicated on the idea that the only legitimate use of the government is to protect private property through a military force. That is the essence of Lockean individualism, right? That is the essence of it. And so the idea that it is more violent to say, we would only do that if it absolutely came to it, and if someone was infringing on the rights of many, many, many people, that is when we would have to intervene, and we would try everything in our power before we would try violence. That is far and away different from Thomas saying, I have the right to shoot you if you're on my property and I don't like it. Right? The idea that one of these systems is more violent than the other is true, but it is totally backward to think that that system is individualism. I mean, again, you cite things like Marsh versus Alabama, the importance of the public square, right? All of these things are true, that in order to preserve our freedoms in any meaningful way, we need public places where that can happen. We need to collectively defend our freedoms, because if we don't do it collectively, if we don't have a public square that actually is guarded, right, by, by, the, by a bill of rights, by some kind of constitution, if we don't have a way to guard and protect those things in a meaningful way, then they don't actually mean anything. Because you could just get off Facebook. You've said that several times in this debate. Just get off Facebook. But it turns out that as soon as you feel like you're being shadow banned on your podcast, you turn around and say, March versus Alabama, right? You turn around and say, I need the collective to intervene on my behalf because you understand that just opting out is not always a way to, to actually access your rights. Opting out sometimes also means opting out of your rights in a very tangible way, a very meaningful way. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, I think to go back to this issue of deregulation, it's important to point out that a corporation like Facebook was made possible by deregulation. When we deregulated the media industries, when we said, you no longer have a limit on how many media corporations you can own, you no longer have a limit on how much of a media market you can corner, that is when media companies began consolidating. Before 1994, things looked very different. We had a diverse array of viewpoints that were uh, that were reflected, right? Where people could get a portion of radio waves, people could get a portion of internet bandwidth uh, in a much more in a much easier way because we had laws in place about how much of a monopoly you could have, right? And it was very low, right? You couldn't have 40 percent of a media market, and that was it. And then we took that away. And now you have things like Sinclair, you have things like Fox, right? You have people like Rupert Murdoch who have bought up 70, 80 percent of some media shares. There were places in this country where every single news channel is owned by the same person. That's not viewpoint diversity, right? If you care about transparency for power, if you care about things like investigative journalism, if you care about being able to actually know what the people governing you are up to, then you need to support an economic system that makes sure that there are checks and balances on the flow of information. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, you said that it would be wrong to say that the whole thing about Bezos. I accept force won't just be used on Jeff Bezos, and I'm going to bring the conversation back to the previous point. What happens to the people that, okay, say we're all living on this collective 
land, and what about the people that don't want to be part of the commune? Say, I just don't want to be part of the commune. What are you going to do with me? That's fine. Society should be voluntary. Okay, society right. should be voluntary. The, the, the only exception to that would be something like uh, if you commit a harm against someone, right, and then you have a justice process you need to go through, and then you opt out and you say, oh, I'm not part of the collective anymore, right? Like, you murder 15 people and then you say, you know what, I'm not part of the collective anymore, right? Like, there are certain situations in which that shouldn't be able to happen. But the reality is that, uh, ironically enough, your solution is true in one instance, which is that, yes, if you do not like society, uh, then I suppose you have the option to leave it. But what about, uh, what about when I say th that, okay, I, I don't want to be part of the commune and I want to keep my property? No, you cannot steal the property that is publicly owned for yourself because you feel exactly. like it. Exactly. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's force. It's force. So you're saying it's only going to be used against Jeff Bezos, but that's not what historically human beings have done. When they've gotten force, they've used it against everybody, and it's been used to oppress. That's how force goes. It's what force does. That's why the Second Amendment is so great. That's why the individual uh, uh, safety net, which is the Bill of Rights, is so valuable it's to protect the individual from the government. No matter how much you downplay the, the effect of litigation, the effect of these, these uh, things that are built into our individualist society that both values the, the majority and the minority uh, opinion, like the Electoral College, which prevents the, uh, prevents the coast from ruling ramps. over the middle, the middle of America, which why would a state stay in a union if their say was completely overridden by the majority uh, on the coasts or whatever the cities? that have no idea how they live. These, these are, the, these are the, the things that, that I disagree with. I disagree with using force to take somebody's private property. But it, we can all say that we don't believe in private property, but there is something you own that you would not give up, whether it be a locket from your great-grandmother, whether it be uh, you know, a gift from somebody that you valued. That's private property. And regardless of whether uh, the, the, she uh, they want to downplay uh, th things like that. It's, it, that has value. If I want to opt out of society and keep my property, that's, that should be my business. We have ways built into our system. There, again, nothing's easy. We can use litigation. We can get together. I can collectively, and I, I agree that we can use the collective to our advantage as long as we all retain our individual independence and don't, aren't uh, slaves to the, co to the uh, collective. And so we can say, uh, Dan Durst and CV, we, let's get together and let's you compile our money and our resources and our, and our platforms to speak truth to power, to use litigation, to use these built-in um, systems to change the, the, uh, the fabric of our society. And I, I think that's fine. That's fine to use the collective to change things as long as everybody retains their individual independence and their private property. I, I just, I don't see a problem with that. I, I agree. There is no problem with that. And not only is there no problem with a collectivist society that operates almost exclusively to protect and defend individual rights, but it is the only possible way that individual rights can be meaningfully defended. At no point in this conversation has Thomas defended how an individualist society would actually be able to reckon with something like Amazon. At no point has there been an explanation about how deregulating Amazon and Facebook as companies would solve the fact that they manipulate users, that their owners use their incredible freedom to be able to oppress and exploit other people. Right? At no point has Thomas explained how individualism would deal with this. Every single time he says, well, in this case collectivism would be good right and that is kind of how it operates now apparently Thomas thinks it's very very violent that he can't go over to James Madison Park uh, and decide and just kind of take to get a tape measure maybe some like nice orange a twine and a couple of wooden stakes and say this is my property now and nobody else gets to use it you know there's a reason why we often say that property is theft because when a bunch of people are using a, set, a public park, a public library, and you walk in and you say, well, this is mine now, and you can't use it anymore, that that is stealing it from everyone else who is using it. And there is no reason why one person should have a more legitimate claim to a public utility, right? whether or not that is something like a public square, whether or not that is something like a public park, whether or not that is something like healthcare, right? There is no reason, uh, well, Healthcare probably is a, a little bit different than other ones because I can't see why people would want to be able to access different healthcare depending on what they need. Right? But when we're talking about actual property, right, when we're talking about land, uh, there's not really a reason why one person should be able to exert a stake on a public park uh, and decide that it is their own. Now, the second thing is that Thomas says that we need the Second Amendment to protect people from the government. 
The reality is that when you have the Second Amendment and you develop militias that have no community accountability, they do not protect people from the government. They become tyrannical and they do things like, and Thomas I'm sure knows all about this, being that he had a three percenters photo on his Facebook page for like a year, uh, but they do things like go down to the border, round up everybody who's brown and turn them over to the government. Right? Your Second Amendment rights are not being used to protect anything that is dear to you. Your Second Amendment rights are being used to create a collective that has no accountability. There are people killed. Right? I've seen footage of people who are killed at the border, no due process, no community rights, by vigilantes who are exercising their Second Amendment rights. And there is no accountability process there to deal with those murders. Right? We have had to see people who have died at the border getting eaten by coyotes, right? their bodies decaying in the desert alone because of what people do with their Second Amendment rights. And so I am not particularly compelled by the idea that freedom is good in all places and you should be able to leave your job and go whatever you want, but you don't get to cross this border. And if you do, I will use my Second Amendment rights to, de to defend the property that I have arbitrarily decided is mine. That is a violation of every libertarian principle. Right? It is a violation of things to say you can leave your job, you can leave this, but what you can't do is walk across this line that we arbitrarily decided decided is there. That doesn't, doesn't yeah, make any sense. We as a collective decided it was there. We, we as a collective decided that these are the yeah, borders. Some decision, okay, we as a collective did not decide on the borders of America. <laughs> that is patently false, right? They were was purchased. patently false? So, we, so our government that was instituted by the collective didn't decide the borders. Our government was not instituted by a collective. Our government was instituted was by wealthy land-owning white males, the only people who could... In the of the not in the interest of the collective, in the interest of themselves, right? In the interest of the only demographic that could vote at the time. The idea that there was collective decision-making power is so completely divorced from the reality of history that it is frankly shocking. And I would like to hear an explanation for any of the ways that individualism would deal with a corporation like Facebook, right? What recourse does an individualist society have to tell Mark Zuckerberg, you are forced to provide the server space for conservatives. You are forced to provide the server space for viewpoints you disagree with. When people threaten, uh, you know, when people are able to create sharp criticism of Facebook, right, to threaten things like strike, Mark Zuckerberg can go in and take everything off that he doesn't like, that challenges him, right? So freedom of speech becomes pretty unfree when some people control the means of it. And I want to know how an individualist society deals with that other than to form a voluntary collective. And if we need a voluntary collective to access any of our rights, if that is always the case, then why would we not just set up a system from the beginning that empowers people to have a say in the decision-making power that impacts their life so that these things don't happen. It shouldn't require a massive amount of exploitation and death to get to that point. Okay, so uh, collectives, collectivists, I see deal and stereotypes quite a bit. So all militias are the same, all, all gun owners are the same, all that. Uh, I think we just disagree on private property. We can use the collective... We can use the collective for our means of law to retain our individual rights and our individual right to own private property. But so officially, you don't agree with the Second Amendment? No, I very much do. Okay, but only if we get together. I never said anything about getting no, together. No, only said if there's accountability property. to the people who have the means to kill others, right? Okay. I should be account. If I walk around my community open carrying an AR, right, I should be accountable to my community for anyone I shoot with it. Right? And how I point it around, right? I should have to obey the four basic rules of gun safety. Right? I shouldn't be allowed to walk around my community with my finger on the trigger like some people in this room may be prone to do. Uh, right? I, and I'm actually not talking about you, Thomas, I swear to God. Um, you know, I shouldn't be able to do things like point my gun at people on the streets. Right? No. There should be accountability about how I use my Second Amendment rights. It doesn't just stop at my body. Right? I can't sit here pointing a loaded weapon no. at, at Jordan no. and him saying, <laughs> You know, and, and the response being, well, as long as you're on your private property, it's really fine. Know. Right? I shouldn't be able to look at my neighbors every day through the scope of a loaded weapon and say, I'm on my private property, can't do anything about it. Right? So I agree with Second Amendment rights, but I also agree in accountability and norms around how we use things that have the power to kill other people. I agree with that. I, would, I agree with that. And that would be potentially, because you don't know how somebody's handling a weapon or whatever, if they point it at you, obviously they are, they're reaching out past their private property. They could potentially reach out past their private property because the bullet travels farther than your private property. Obviously, I don't think that people should be going around pointing loaded weapons, whether they're on their property or somebody else's property. I just agree that you have the right to your property. You have the right to the, to the fruits of your labor. And... The fruits of your labor, whatever that buys, whatever whatever way we agree. I mean, I don't I don't think that 
everything being public property is ever going to end up well because there is somebody that is going to have to distri distribute that, figure out how to do that, and you're going to say it's a commune with all these protections and stuff, but what happens to... The, what happens to the guy that gets corrupted and is, is the, say they're distributing bread or food? What's gonna, what happens when he starts deciding, oh, well, I'm going to take a little bit extra bread for me and my friends and my buddies and, and you know, screw the little people. I, I'm going to take a little extra for me because that's the nature of people. When you start distributing things and you have to distribute, you, you end up having the privilege of being the distributor. And when you have the privilege of being the distributor, you start taking a little bit more for yourself. That's the nature of human beings. After, power corrupts us. And we start taking a little bit more for ourselves. I see our system now, not, not exactly the way it is, because I feel like there's lots of changes needed, but I feel like our system now is still better than a uh, collectivist, libertarian, socialist, anarchist society. I feel like that's going to always... And like, how would you defend a co uh, collectivist state, a libertarian, socialist state? Would you develop militias, and what's going to stop those militias from becoming exactly like you said, saying, okay, you're stepping over our border, you're obviously not going to be able to conquer the world, or are you going to conquer the world? I mean, I, I mean that's, that's exactly what I mean. Like, how are you going to ensure that it's going to continue? And through these systems that you're going to need to continue it are going to come the corruption and are going to come the oppression that comes with the collective society that I feel has always been more prone to corruption rather than the uh, society we have that was based on starting with individual rights. Maybe it didn't start off uh, with everybody being morally correct. Because a lot of the founding fathers were not morally correct. Uh, but it, it started with an idea which was morally correct, which we work towards every day, which is creating a better Republican democracy that serves people better and protects their individual rights. And I think we can all... I, and, and I feel like the operation of libertarian socialism operates on the fact that there is a finite amount of property, finite amount of space, a finite amount of room. It doesn't take into account that people are innovative and we can get off this planet. We can do other things. We can use the market. We can use, uh, we can use freedom to propel ourselves into and create things that will allow us all to have a, a little stake of land, a little, a little stake of liberty, a little freedom for ourselves and for our family. There, what happens if people steal some bread? I don't know. What happens if Jeff Bezos steals roughly $100 billion worth of his workers' wages, right? The idea of theft is something that is universal. And so the idea of community accountability for people who are in positions of power to distribute resources is the heart of collectivism, right? When socialists talk about, oh, we have to have the means of production and the means of distribution, that's the kind of stuff we are talking about, is that it shouldn't be one unaccountable person who's distributing the bread. There should be transparency in the way that this happens. Those people should be in positions where the community can hold them accountable, can recall them if necessary and put someone else in those positions. And that's the same thing with militias. What you have in an individual society is you have privatized militia forces. You have things like Blackwater, you have the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons are out there running drills right now preparing for a climate catastrophe or at least preparing for the idea that the wealthy will fear a climate catastrophe. They're preparing to secure vast amounts of resources. There are people who own entire islands, right? Entire Hawaiian islands, places where lots of people live. You want to talk about company towns, there are, there are Hawaiian islands that 500,000 people live on where 80% of the island is owned by one person who has a private security force who operates at his whim and his whim only. You want to talk about what happens when the militias become unaccountable, that's what happens under individualism. That's what happens when power is something that you do not work to distribute, you do not work to democratize, that the accountability mechanisms that communities need are nowhere to be found because you've placed all of your free time. Thomas has to come up with a solution to a problem. He turns to collectivism. I want to know what is the individualist solution to a company like Facebook. I want to know what is the individualist solution to a problem like poverty, right? Because just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is not a very good answer when some people are not born with boots, right? You have to deal with the reality of the status quo, which is that we live in a world of unequal wealth. We live in a world with unequal access to freedoms, and then that is a problem. If you want people to be meaningfully free, then you have to make sure that society is safeguarded and actually allows them to access that. I mean, you talk about the idea that people are always prone to corruption. That's true. It's harder to corrupt a lot of people than it is to corrupt one person, especially if that person has a lot of money and that tends to corrupt itself. Uh, but it's also, you know, you say society is hard. Life is hard. You have to work for it. That is the reality of collectivism. Society is difficult. 
And if you don't take it seriously, right, if you don't meet your obligation and your responsibility to each other, if you decide you don't care about what's going on in the government, you don't want to be informed, you don't care if the person is stealing bread who distributes it, right, if you decide that you don't care about any of those things, then yeah, someone might come along, a demagogue, and take advantage of you, right, and they might use it to steal your freedoms. But the reality of that is that people have to work hard for society. We don't disagree with that. Only one of us provides a way where people's hard work is actually returned to them, where they actually get the fruits of their labor, and especially because so many things that we access are not things that we can produce as individuals. There was one of your podcast episodes where you said that it wouldn't be fair, if, even if all the roads were privatized, all the roads were privately owned, it wouldn't be fair for those corporations to say, well, conservatives can't drive on our roads. And I think that's actually very insightful, because even if you have your little piece of private property, you have your home, if you can't use any of the roads that connect it to anything else, it becomes worthless. And something like a road is something that you come together and you fund because it connects people. Because there are all sorts of industries that are networked. Things like social media and traditional media, right, those are networked things. They are cheaper the more you scale them up. They are cheaper to produce. Something like healthcare is cheaper to produce when we scale it up and include a lot of people in it because it helps distribute the risk and distribute the cost. Most of the things that we need as a society are better cared for when we all share in the burden of caring for them, when we all share in the labor for caring, uh, of caring for those things. And so yes, a collectivist society is a lot of hard work. It is. It requires you to seriously put on your boots and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and go in every day and work not only for your freedom but for everyone else's freedom, not at the threat of hunger and starvation and death like an individualist society, but at the threat of losing the things that you love. And I think that is an incentive that people care about. People care about their libraries. People care about their public parks, right? People treat these things like they're precious because they are. They don't need them to be privatized and only their own in order to care about preserving them. I agree with a society that can use collectivism for its gain, but co individuals can retain their private property. That's the biggest difference. They, they retain their rights, they retain their private property, they retain their right to defend themselves, they retain their speech, they retain all those things. Facebook's main commodity is my information. So technically that's my property. So that's why they are accountable to me. That's why I'm using an individualist approach when I say I will hire a lawyer. That lawyer will work for me. I will talk to Daniel Durst who gets his own lawyer. We'll have our own team of lawyers and we will cause enough trouble for them, enough pressure, and make enough noise within the community that they will have to be answerable. And even if that's a national community, that's, that's, that's an individualist approach, whether you think it is or not. I'm not saying that individuals can never come, to collect, come together collectively, but they must retain certain individual rights, in, which is in, including private property. You said that some of us don't have access to the same freedoms, correct? Or just the same economic freedoms? The same freedoms. So what laws, what, what freedoms are those that we don't all have access to? You have produced 10 podcast episodes about how conservatives are being denied their freedom of speech by Facebook. Yeah, but that's on their platform. We've made our own platforms, but then they organize and racketeer, which is actually illegal. But you have to find the proof for that, which is where investigating And then again, your way of intervening in. in something like that, right, your way of maintaining and preserving your freedom to speech is to hire a lawyer, which... I guess if you can't go hire a lawyer, go fuck yourself, right? You don't get a right to free speech if you don't have the money to hire a lawyer because... Oh, good. Find a pro bono lawyer. Great. Good option, Thomas. To take your lawyer and to go to the collectivist system of justice that we have established and to ask the collective to intervene on your behalf, right? To take a lawyer and to say, Facebook is exerting their individual rights to property, right? To the servers, to the digital space. They are exerting their individual right to property in a way that compromises my freedom. And so now I need to call upon the collective to protect that. There is no way that you, the only way that you can do that as an individual beyond that is to march yourself over to Mark Zuckerberg's house, property rights be damned, and I guess shoot him too. I, I think you're taking this completely uh, intellectually dishonest way. Um, so, we, we, have, we have ability to hire a lawyer, yes. We have, a, we have an ability, but you, you fail to realize that Facebook's commodity is my property, my information. That's not and even to, what your boy Locke thinks. You are a Lockean, that's what you told me, I'm a Lockean individualism. Locke believed in the idea of lead men. I said there was lead, multiple influences lead men are in a, my Lead men are a class ideas. of non-property owning individuals who are tied to the land and forced to work there. They are indentured servants. Right? And in, and, sure. 
less audience commentary, but yes. Right? And so the idea that that is your property doesn't change the fact that you signed a contract with Facebook. You don't pay for Facebook, right? Facebook owes you nothing under your world. And so you signed a contract in which you traded access to Facebook servers for all of the things that you produce. That's not your property. You legally, signed a contract. They don't, the rule, they don't enforce the rules equally. Legally. They, even they are not, even they that don't have contract to. that you sign is not legally enforced equally. So therefore, even under our laws, which is an in, we have an individualist country, a country that's based on balancing the individual rights against the rights of the majority and against the rights of those with power. Oh. No. Where? What minority? What minority is protected in that way? The only minority protected in that way is billionaires, and that's it. The individual is protected by their rights, by their ability to speak out, by their ability to use the, uh, the resources at their disposal to cause change and speak truth to power. Yes. What? All right. Can you, well, can it, where, has there ever, where has there ever been a situation where speaking truth to power produced change and not people coming together Amassing in the streets and rioting like hell until power did something. Right? Where was there ever but they a time? Still their individual rights properly. But where was there ever a time where speech accomplished that? Because the flow of information is owned by individuals who Anytime control. Anytime individuals it. wrote books that inspired other people to get together. So when people got together, that is always no, great. No, no, when no, individuals when wrote books that inspired people to, to make a change in their society. And it starts with an individual, with an idea. It always starts with an individual and an idea. That's how it works. But the idea and the individual don't affect that change until the moment it is collectivized, which is the entire point. Yes, individuals have ideas. Yes, it affects that change and by changing people's minds and changing the minds of the majority. Why should you have to change the minds of the majority to accomplish something? Why should your rights be contingent on your capacity because to convince the a majority works. People of... People don't just get born with the right ideas. You, 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 li you live, you learn, you change your mind. You do different things to, to get different outcomes. That's the way life works. All right, I'm going to ask it one more time. What is the individualist solution to a company like Amazon? What do you do when Jeff Bezos owns an entire town and a private security force? What is the individualist solution to that? Use your resources to either get out of that job and go to a different job okay. or make yourself more marketable or go to school or, or use what you can to improve your situation. And when the next person comes in and takes that job, spends then you go, all you'll be in a different job So if you're competent. And you don't care about the person who takes that job over? You don't care about their... You're fine letting Jeff Bezos exploit... Thousands and thousands of workers and control their homes, them. control use, the storefronts. Use your freedom of speech to speak out against that company and let the person who's coming in know, hey, look, this is the way it is here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go here. I'll oh, stand outside the building and tell people as they walk in and when they put in the app, you know. Yeah. People tried hired. that. You know what Amazon did? They took thousands of workers and they flooded social media. They made fake Twitter. I mean, they were actually real then Twitter they accounts because they were right actual. To stand outside. So they should shoot him. No, not shoot him. Stand just stand carry up. the guns around. Yeah. Just one, just one person with a gun. That's what's going to take Amazon down. Probably going to take it's more that than that. There right? is the ability at the individual's fingertips to do <laughs> multiple different things to change their situation and the situation of the collective. That's not been built into any real socialist society. I've no made, society that's work. been socialist. Okay, yeah, Rojava is, is, is in the middle of a war-torn country that's, you know, militarily occupied by several different people and being, and being supplied by several different foreign nations. It's not going to exist 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years from now, I guarantee, or else there's going to be a local militia that's gained so much power that it gets, that it gets bowled over, but that's a hypothetical. We're talking about governing nations, governing large swaths of land and large, different, non-homogenous populations, and people who don't believe the same things, people who have different ideas. This is what we're talking about. Our system of federalism, of republicanism, of, uh, of having a constitution, republicanism in that it is a republic, is yeah. representative of the best situation that we have, the best system that's created the best outcomes for the most amount of people. And you could call that collectivist, but it's not. It protects the individual right over everything. It I says that the majority can be unjust. I don't know think a collectivist society does. If not, at this point, I feel like I've made it pretty clear that the purpose of the collective 
the purpose of establishing a Bill of Rights that is a set of norms that a community decides on together through a consensus process. People often use the analogy of the Wikipedia model, which I think is a brilliant analogy, because Wikipedians, not only are all of the editors voluntary, right, and anyone can edit a page, but it's also true that the norms of Wikipedia themselves are modifiable by the community. And it took a while to sort out, but it's now one of the most efficient running websites. It's one of the most visited websites in the world. It's a more reliable source of information than Google by far. And so the idea that this doesn't work anywhere, we see it work again and again. We see all of your solutions. The idea of a federated republic of socialist anarchist communities is actually exactly the thing that I think should happen, right? But federalism itself, uh, a republic itself, these are collective societies because ultimately humans are inevitably social, right? Someone has to build the polling places, someone has to build the roads, and it makes more sense to distribute those things with the entire community because everyone is going to use them. In any other circumstance in the entire world, if you refuse to pay for the things that were needed for society to function, if you just said, I'm not going to pay my part, right? I'm not going to pay my taxes. I'm not going to pay for my part of the road. I'm not going to pay for my part of the public park. I opt out of this. You would call that theft. People opting out of paying for the things that they use, you would call theft in any other situation. And so you, you drove here, right? Drove to Milwaukee and back. You enjoy making use of these things. You would not appreciate if they were privatized. There are countries you can go to where you can pay $5 to enter a park, where there are no benches, there are no recycling bins, where people carry their trash home in little baggies because we don't have public sanitation in those well, countries. I don't use those services and I just want to be outside the commune and retain my private property. You, you've never thrown out a can in a public trash can. You've never used a I'm road. Saying, you've lived your entire life in your home. Obviously, you know, that's not true. Right, because I'm it's saying, not possible, Thomas. Want, it's not just you, true, it's not possible. The Amish possible. do it. The Amish, and they don't pay as much tax. They don't pay for all the services that we all pay for because they've opted out of society. They are also conscientious, conscientious objectors, and they don't have to provide military service. They are a religious sect that opts out, and we allow that because we are individuals, because we allow different dissenting opinions. I allow that some people may not want to give up their private property. And I'd be fine with the collectivist society that said, you can keep your private property, you stay over here, we'll stay over here, and we'll do our thing. But that's not, a, that's not even possible under your definition of, of this socialist libertarian, libertarian socialist society. You, because that's theft. Nobody That's just, collective. No, That's theft private collective. property did not come from God. Private property came by stealing the things that everyone was using and making it your own. I disagree. And we need, there is no, where, where is there, ever, I just, where do you I think private property rights come from? They come from the enforcement of a government that uses the police state in order to enforce those property rights. You've said that yourself many times in this, and thank you, by the way, the Amish is a collectivist society that I hadn't actually thought about, but you're right. It is a very, very well-functioning collectivist society that is not in a war-torn country that manages to sustain itself exceptionally well. You know why? Because, because it is they collectively... Have tradition that's, that's, that's tradition is a they collectivist have a concept. System, yeah. Tradition <laughs> is a collect... There is no individual tradition that has half as much meaning as a collective one. Tradition is the kind of thing that gets destroyed in individual societies because individualism atomizes people. It forces them to think only of themselves. It forces them to think but only you're, of the property twisting, that they you're own. You're twisting what I believe. You can come together as a collective to do things. Right, and my argument is that when you but come you together as a collective... But you must protect the individual's not just right to speak, but to dissent and to retain the fruits of their labor. You can't just say... I. You know, how much do you think, I don't even, I don't know, do you know how much people spend to be, uh, you know, a, a medical doctor? Probably quite a bit of money, right? Okay, and then you turn around and say, okay, now we're instituting the, uh, the Libertarian Socialist Society and your labor is free, sir. Do not, do not pass go, do not collect $200. So you're then turning their work, their labor. How is that fair to them to say that their labor is now collective property, community property? That's, I agree that we sometimes need to work together. A lot of times we should work together, and a lot of times we should talk to each other, and, and we live in a society because we're social animals. But that doesn't negate our rights as individuals. And that is the main principle of, why, of how society should be created. They should be created to empower and to uh, protect the individual's rights. And I know after your uh, rebuttal, I have to get going. It's, it's getting a little... One, getting a little one could be forgiven for thinking, given how little we're paid, that things like teachers and librarians are actually doing free labor for the collective. Uh, but that's not how it works, right? Public school teachers are paid. Librarians who work in public libraries are paid. Doctors in, 
in countries where there is socialized medicine are paid, right? I don't know what you think happens. I don't know, again, if you think that police come to the door and they force doctors to go to the hospital no, every day. No, no. I don't know if that's how you think that these societies that's work. But the idea that you keep repeating, right, that humans are social animals, that people should be able to voluntarily form collective agreements with each other, well, the only difference rights. while retaining their individual rights, what you seem to fail to forget over and over and over again is that we live in a world in which we are networked with each other. And the best possible societal arrangement is not one that says, you retain the right to yourself, and anyone is able, as long as you voluntarily enter into this indentured servitude contract, that is perfectly fine. What it means is that, as a collective, we have an obligation to each other to treat each other without exploiting each other, right? To not do physical violence to each other, right? But we also have responsibilities socially in other ways, and that we should design a society that takes that into account. If humans are, by nature, social animals, if we need each other to survive, if living alone on your private property sounds more like torture than it does a fulfilled, free life, that is because humans are by nature social, and when we think about how to establish a society that can actually account for human nature, right, that allows people to flourish, that allows people to most productively create voluntary arrangements with each other, that cannot happen unless you preserve individual freedom at a collective level that you stop people from trampling over each other. That that is not some kind of undue influence, that that is not coercion, that that is the meaning of liberty and freedom, right, to make sure that people can be meaningfully free meaningfully free to use their lives or to make choices that choices are actually available to them. Like the idea that we should just act as individuals and as long as I got mine, I don't have to do anything else, is not realistic because humans are inevitably social. And so we should have a society that is designed around and incentivizes not only sociality, but incentivizes the kind of sociality that is good for humanity, right? That's what churches were excellent at for a long time. Not in all the ways, but in some of the ways, right? That's what cultural institutions and traditions have done the most to preserve, because those are collectivist institutions. It is when we became atomized, it is when we only began thinking of ourselves, that society started to break down because we didn't care if other people were exploited. You see right now, you can look right now, you post a video that says conservatives shouldn't be banned by Facebook, I guarantee you a bunch of liberals are going to say, ha ha, too bad, nobody cares about preserving each other's freedom of speech anymore. Mm -hmm. it, they care about how they can accumulate power and wield it against someone else. Right right now, it's very nice. We're censoring all these conservatives. We're censoring Alex Jones. As soon as conservatives get into power, we are fucked, right? The idea that we should just collectively make arrangements and wield power against each other in any way we see fit is a very poor substitute for actually decentralizing the power that impacts us. Well, and I don't think that the state just forces uh, doctors. But they determine the price, and the price the doctor should be able to determine the price for what their time and what their uh, education is worth. They should be able to decide that, not the state. Yeah, that's the what state Bezos says too. He should state, be able to determine yeah, what your labor is worth. And he gets subsidies. And every every uh, industry that has subsidies, like college, I guarantee you, everybody, a lot of people in here believe that college is too highly priced. It's because competition is cut, subsidies are given. They know the government's going to pay the subsidies. Oh, tuition is uh, what? Oh, it's ten thousand. No, it's actually twenty thousand dollars. The state's paying for it. Yeah, we'll give them. It's twenty thousand dollars now, and then it goes up, and there's no competition. Look at the price of college textbooks. There is no competition. You have to get that textbook. And how much is it? What, like $300 a textbook? $400 a textbook? I mean, that's outrageous. There's no competition in that field. That's, I'm saying that re individuals should retain their property rights, retain the right to their labors, retain that. I'm not saying that we should shun each other. I'm not saying that we should own. I'm saying that individual autonomy in action, in speech, in, in the right to their labor and to the to the uh, fruits of their labor is very important and needs to be the central organizing principle that when we come together in a uh, societal union that we protect those things <clears throat> so that the, either the majority doesn't oppress or the, the, the dictator doesn't oppress. That's um, as good a point as any 15 minutes after the, um, the that I think we have the building, uh, and it sounds like you all have to go as well. I think this conversation could probably go on forever. Yeah. Uh, it probably should um, in a lot of different ways. I want to thank both of our um, competitors for uh, engaging in this kind of um, marathon of an argument. So a round of applause for both of you. I hope this starts a conversation that continues far beyond uh, what this classroom is, and I, I hope that we have more of these discussions. Thank you all. Thanks for all being here, all you guys. Thanks, Sydney. I appreciate it.
on G. That's fiery stuff. Oh, it's gone. It's so fucking... That was some good, that was some good content, dude. Oh, man. That was some fiery stuff. Lots of passion. I think that was the guy that I I think that was the guy that I argued with at the rally. Was he like was he chest bumping you? No, no. It was the guy that I was like we were talking about um <laughs> Was it was it you like calling shit out the entire debate, dude? Well, I'm sorry, man. It's a totally fucking repressive. Repressive. You know, I mean, you know. of, of well, if it's so, you know, if it's repressive, just let him hang himself with his own. You know, well, you don't I'm have to be sorry, the. Sorry, but I have to say, I got you, you got to be the. I got there at six thirty. At, at two hours later, I'm still. All I'm saying, here. all I'm saying is, you ain't got to be the organic peanut gallery. All That's I'm all sorry. I'm saying. Okay. You know. <laughs> everybody got sat there and mute. <laughs> it just made me want to gouge my own eyes out. It's all just the constant brain interruption and the flow of the conversation. I thought it was good. I was dying in the beginning, kind of, and then it got kind of stalemated, and then it was kind of silly, and then it was kind of me. And then it was I just, forward. I was enjoying it if it weren't for dude, like, you know. I think, Repeatedly. I mean, I give Sylvia a lot of points. More, probably more than me. Because, I mean, if I would have had my freaking notebook... Hey, which, by me. the way, it was not me. No, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't me. I just, I used you as an excuse, man. <laughs> no, but then... Like, we were there, and then, like, we, like, I, I grabbed my shirt, and then I didn't grab my fucking notebook. No, but then the chattering peanut gallery started in with the fake laughing and shit. Hey, yeah. so, you want to go to a fucking walking spot, chill, maybe we'll buy you a beer or something, or maybe not, a, got to drive, I don't know. Yeah, I don't drink. Right, I I don't really drink that much either, but like once a month I'll do like a mini binge or something. Do you want to stop, do you need to stop home for anything first? No. Do you want to drive, do you want us to drive right back, do you want me to drive? You sure you kind of sat through a whole hell of a lot there. Did I? Uh... What, are you talking about going to here by yourself? Well, no. Maybe you're going to take him from. I mean, 90, like, it was 90% people that knew CV, and they were 90%, like, good sports. Uh, yeah, it was just, you know. I thought it was all right. I mean, I didn't. Th I thought it was going to be less civil than it ended up being, which I'm very grateful for. It's up here, I think. You're smoking on a Lucky Strike? No, I just ripped the filters off because I'm itching for cancer. Dude, like, I think I think, it's over I think a Lucky Strike's the only pack that I've ever bought. Well, other than. <laughs> When I was 18, it's embarrassing to admit, but I did buy a pack of cloves once. That was embarrassing, but I did that. <sighs> that shit will make you dizzy and nauseous. It was definitely good practice, man. I haven't fucking racked my brain like that in ages. Thanks for letting me use you as an excuse for the notebook. <laughs> I just, I just like. I had not... so much shit written down in there. Yeah, but I thought, I didn't even know that she was going to have as many notes as she did. 
Never underestimate your opponent. No, I mean, uh, I think when... Is this a private or a public tree that I could potentially piss I'm on? taking advantage of the... But, like, yeah, at least <laughs> I got her to admit that, like... The guillotine, but she kept saying, oh, it's only going to be Bezos, but it's probably going to be Yeah, Bezos. she kept going to Bezos, and I was thinking, because, I mean, I don't know why there wasn't a Q&A, but I would have asked if I, you know, I mean, I'm not sure if I would have asked anything, but it, it just, I would have been it, like, what, hold on a sec, I would have been like, hold on a second, what about the family filing jointly for like 125k to 250k See, that has to pay like half of, the the fuck, half of their fucking money in taxes, like what about them? That That's more or less like... Wait. It was over here somewhere. No, it was over here because I remember this building. Did you get car? How come when I'm pushing my car button and all that stuff? Oh, I was going to say to. No way, dude. But no, again, um, it's not about Bezos. It's about the family filing jointly for like 125 to 250 a year, who already pays like half, you know? State, property, federal. Yeah. That's what I would have brought up. I'm sure she's going to write an article saying, who's an idiot? 